All right. We're now talking about molecular mechanical computing. And this is a talk about work done by myself and my colleagues. And you can see from the slides that there are quite a few of us who have worked on this. So there are two papers involved. The two papers are mechanical computing systems using only links and rotary joints. That's the first paper that describes the general concepts and how it all works. And then the second paper, evaluating the friction of rotary joints in molecular machines, which focuses specifically on the energy dissipation in the rotary joints. So the conclusion of all of this is that you can get 10 to the 21st flops in the volume of a sugar cube using one watt of power with a 100 megahertz clock. And the key concept, as you can see from the slide, is a two-rail mechanical reversible shift register. And we will explain how that two-rail mechanical reversible shift register works in the talk. But what you're looking at is a four-cell mechanical reversible shift register. <clears throat> so, general idea. It's been observed for some time that the clock speed of microprocessors hit a wall somewhere in the 2003 time frame. And that wall was somewhere in the vicinity of 3 or 4 gigahertz. And we've had a hard time going much faster ever since then. And that wall basically is because of heat. We are not able to cool our computers adequately, and therefore we can't run them faster. So, what's the problem? Well, the problem is fairly simple. When you move electrons through wires, they generate heat. That's the I squared R problem. To be a bit more quantitative about it, if you move an electron through a wire some 10 nanometers in distance, at a speed of 10 nanoseconds, corresponding to the 100 megahertz we were talking about. And if you assume it goes through a contact, you often have to have features in your wiring in order to have any kind of circuitry, then you're going to have at least 13 kilo ohms for fundamental quantum mechanical reasons. And unless you anticipate having ballistic transport as in a single wall nanotube, where there are no features whatsoever in a long nanotube, which seems difficult to do if you want to have um, electronic circuits, then you're going to have something like 750 times KT, uh, or 3 times 10 to the 18th joules energy dissipation as you switch in your switching operations. This is a lot of heat and is going to cause problems if you have electronic devices. Well, that leads to an obvious question. Are there alternatives to electronics? And the answer, of course, is yes. We can have such things as mechanical computing devices, such as, well, in the 1800s, people talked about Babbage's engine or the difference engine, which is basically the, an early form of mechanical computing. But mechanical computing, of course, also has dissipative mechanisms, and those dissipative mechanisms also cause problems, which raises the question, can you have a mechanical form of computing which has minimal dissipation uh, involved? And the answer is, well, there, there are various approaches. The approach we're going to discuss here is an approach which uses rotary joints and links and not much else. So the idea is you have links, which are mechanical objects that transport the forces, and rotary joints, which allow those transported forces to interac interact with each other. And we have clocks which drive the links. And the system rules we're going to operate under are that there are periodic clocking forces, 
which are about a piconewton, very small forces, and the links make contact only through the rotary joints. So there are no other contacts between the links to confuse the issues or make the design more difficult. There are no unconstrained degrees of freedom. All of the degrees of freedom are constrained and controlled. The system is driven by a four-phase clock and the system is fully reversible. So there's some additional perspectives that you can take on this. One is that the time t uniquely determines the position of every link in the system up to the uncertainty caused by thermal noise. Also, the system can operate as slowly as might be desired. In other words, it's a semi-static design where you can move quickly or slowly depending on the clock speed or the clock driving system. And the system can operate both forwards and in reverse depending on the clock driver. So it is fully reversible. So the obvious question, how do you compute under these constraints? So we're going to define two additional primitives, or rather we'll define two primitives. The first is a lock and the second is a balance. And then we're going to build our computational system on these two primitives. Uh, these, along with periodic clocking forces, will allow us to implement a shift register and then a Fredkin gate. <coughs> so, as we can see, a data link can be in one of two positions. The data link can either be in the zero position to the left, or it can be in the one position to the right. And that allows us to encode zero and one. It also allows us to transport zero and one over distance. And the only thing that's involved, of course, is the movement of the links as, a, excuse me, the movement of the links as allowed by the rotary joints. Now, it's interesting to observe that you can have additional links that are attached between the base and the mobile link, um, but you have to do it right if you want to allow freedom of motion. If you add a link between the base and the, the moving link that goes back and forth in the wrong way, it will lock up the mobile link. So that's an interesting observation, and we're going to take advantage of that observation when we design our lock. So the next illustration is kind of critical, so I want you to pay close attention to it. The top four bar linkage um, has three vertical links, which allow the top triangular structure to move back and forth freely. Now, as long as the top triangular linkage is able to move back and forth freely, then it is unconstrained and can move to the right, and we'll illustrate that. There it is, it's moved to the right. And what's interesting is once you do that, the bottom triangular linkage is now locked in place. And it's locked in place because the middle link, the one that's red, is now no longer able to allow the bottom triangular linkage to move. In other, the, in other words, the bottom triangular linkage now has three links that connect it, and the middle red linkage is no longer at the same angle as the two side links, and therefore it locks up the bottom link, or the bottom triangular structure. So that's what the lock does. The lock, when the top uh, triangular linkage is moved to the right, it locks the bottom triangular linkage. So that's a very interesting property, and we're now going to take advantage of that. <clears throat> As you can see on the left, we have the lock and the unlocked state, 
and on the right top we have the lock where it's locked the bottom uh, portion. The top portion has moved and locked the bottom part and on the bottom of it the bottom part shows the uh, the lock in the zero one position. It's moved the bottom part of the lock and it's locked the upper part of the lock. So you can lock either the top or the bottom of the lock and that allows you to essentially encode one bit of information or to have an unlocked position as seen on the left. So that's a lock and that's a very useful device in our computational apparatus. So the lock can actually be implemented at the molecular scale and you can see now in this illustration a possible molecular implementation where you have acetylenic joints representing the rotary joints or implementing the rotary joints and diamond, sheets of diamond, implementing the links. Now we move to the balance. The balance, as its name implies, is simply a link which can balance or rotate around a link in the center. And if we go to the next slide, we see that the balance fundamentally consists of a link with a rotary joint in the center, and on top and bottom we have rotary joints connecting to more links uh, um, that are horizontally placed in this illustration. So now what happens? We now have a full-blown cell, and the full-blown cell consists of three locks, the top lock, the bottom lock, and the output lock. Uh, the two, the top lock and the bottom lock are labeled holding areas, and the output lock uh, actually holds the data once the holding locks have held it while the clock signal in the yellow area has been applied. So the idea here is fairly straightforward. An input is applied to either the top or the bottom holding lock. So on the next slide you see an input has been applied to the upper holding lock. And if you apply that input to the upper holding lock, and now you apply a clock signal to the balance, that will force the balance to drive the lower lock, because the lower lock is free to move, whereas the upper lock, because of the input signal, is prevented from moving. And the lower lock will then drive the output lock, so the output lock is now locked, and um, is now holding the data. So now we see a sequence of locks, a sequence of four uh, cells actually in a shift register, and this shows the sequence of four cells in a shift register being driven by a four-phase drive mechanism a cam at the bottom of the illustration which rotates and the cam is driving the four cells of the four um, shift of four elements of the four cells of the shift register sequentially. You can see that they are moving in sequence and if you're really careful about it you might even be able to figure out how it is that one bit of data is being driven through the four cells from the left to the right. So that is a shift register and the whole thing is fully reversible and has very low energy dissipation. Now it turns out, and I won't go into the details very much, I'll simply assert 
that you can make a Fredkin gate out of the same kind of locks and I will flash up the illustration showing the layout for a Fredkin gate using logic cells. So you can see the same kind of memory cells connected to each other but now forming a Fredkin gate. And if you're interested you can go off and look at how that design works and think about it. But it's basically the same concept but laid out as a Fredkin gate. So, what's the energy dissipation of this whole thing? Well, the rotary joints have very little drag, and if you think about it long enough, you'll realize that the other dissipative mechanisms, if you design the mechanism appropriately, can have even less drag than the rotary joints. So, essentially, the way that you operate is to count up the drag in the rotary joints and then ignore the drag from the other mechanisms because they have less drag than the rotary joints. What is the drag in the rotary joints? Well, here's an equation. The power dissipation from the rotary joints is some appropriate con constant multiplied by the rotational velocity squared. So there's an equation. And the equation has a constant in it and we need to figure out the constant. So to figure out the constant, we took a exemplar molecular system, which has a rotor, which we spun in a molecular dynamics calculation. And after spinning the rotor, we watched it spin down. And actually, we did some more clever things than that. But basically, we did an analysis of the molecular dynamics of a rotor system, figured out the drag, and came up with a number for the constant. And the constant is 2 times 10 to the minus 35th joule seconds. And we have a very nice paper that analyzes the drag and discusses what it is and analyzes the molecular dynamics. And there is a number, and we're reasonably confident that that number is at least a good approximation to the drag. So, what's the energy dissipation? Well, you figure out your logic system, then you count the rotary joints, determine their rotational speed, apply the equation for power dissipation, and then you neglect the other dissipative mechanisms. What are the other dissipative mechanisms? Well, we looked through them fairly carefully, and no, I will not go through them at this point. I will simply show a slide with a long list of dissipative mechanisms that we thought about and assert that they can be made very small if you're careful. So the conclusion is we get 10 to the 21st flops per watt in a sugar cube, and it should be possible to get more efficient gate implementations and more efficient implementations of floating point operations. So we're reasonably confident that 10 to the 21st flops per watt is achievable. And that is the end of the talk. Thank you very much.